not take uh, a minute or two just to introduce Christy um, because you'll realise that you'll be in fantastic um, uh, care this afternoon with Christy's expertise. So Christy Van Digley is the Interprofessional Learning Lead at the Faculty of Medicine Health at the University of Sydney. Christy wears many hats as well. Um, she's also a PhD candidate with the Sydney Medical School specialising in interprofessional education. Her role involves coordinating and developing interprofessional learning activities for the faculty and does a fantastic job managing the delivery of large scale student activities, such as the Health Collaboration Challenge, which we'll hear about today, um, but also an IPL introductory workshop, which attracts over 2,600 students. Christie's received several awards and most recently was awarded a really prestigious 2021 International Aspire to Excellence Team Award in Inspirational Approaches to Health Professionals Education for the Peer Teacher Training Program. And some of you might know that this was from the Association for Medical Education of Europe, the AMI Group. Christie's research interests and past projects have been related to health professionals education, interprofessional learning, leadership and peer teaching. So we really welcome Christy here this afternoon. This session has a little bit of everything. So Christy's going to give a presentation um, which showcases more about the Healthcare Collaboration Challenge, a big IPL simulation program at the University of Sydney. We'll also take some breaks to do some interactive activities and you might be popped out into some breakout rooms and therefore can apply some of the uh, features of the HCC to simulation programs that you might be involved in. We'll also make sure that there's some time to come back together to go through some Q&As. If at any time you would like to ask a question um, of Christy, please use the right-hand side of the WOVA app to type them in the chat there. So I think that's all from me for the moment. So uh, Christy, you can get your slides ready to share and a huge big welcome. And um, we can't wait for the session this afternoon. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Belinda. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen? Yes, that's all fine, yeah. Christy, and we can hear you well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, so I am Christy Van Diggle, Interprofessional Learning Lead at the um, University of Sydney, and I'll be speaking to you about interprofessional simulation at scale um, in the health professions. And by at scale, we're talking about really large numbers of students. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and would like to extend our acknowledgement to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island people with us today. And I'm joining you from Garingai land of the Eora Nation, and you may like to include the lands that you're joining us from in the chat window. So um, Belinda gave you a bit of an overview of how the session will run um, in ter terms of interaction and a Q&A. Um, but this is the content that I'll be covering, as well as where those activities are placed in the overall scheme of things. So we'll talk about our large scale simulation activity, the Health Collaboration Challenge, and how we've grown in student numbers from the original 16 students through to 1,697 in 2021. Um, we'll then do a quick little short activity in the chat window before moving on to looking at some evaluation data, um, comparing the face-to-face sessions to the online sessions, and then look at how we're changing our approach to interprofessional learning at the university. Um, we'll then do a breakout session, um, looking at simulation programs and how they can be upscaled or made interprofessional. And then we'll also look at some helpful tips for large scale activities um, before moving on to the Q&A. So I'd like to begin by providing you a bit of context. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of the University of Sydney. Um, we're fortunate enough to have one of the largest range of health professional degrees in Australia, and we also run some of the largest interprofessional activities in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, some of the disciplines that are included in these activities include medicine, physiotherapy, pharmacy, or health dentistry, speech pathology, nursing, radiography, dietetics, and I could keep going on for a while longer. Um, and we're when we're talking about interprofessional learning, we're talking about when two or more health professions work together um, and they're learning about from and with each other 
to enable effective collaboration and in the end hope to improve um, health outcomes. So about two years ago, the university went, underwent a restructure and with that multiple faculties merged into the Faculty of Medicine and Health. And with that, we brought about the interprofessional learning strategy. And you can see there on the image on the right that simulation forms a large part of this strategy. Um, with this, we also introduced an e-passport, which is where we collate a whole lot of students into professional activities into one location for them to see and share with future employers. Um, and we formed the group called CHES Collaborative Health Education Sydney. And they're the um, kind of the decision makers and the doers involved in interprofessional learning. So the large simulation activity that I'm talking about is the Health Collaboration Challenge. And this is a case-based activity that's um, low fidelity. So it's simple, well, not simple, it's quite complex patient cases that students are provided with. And students are from their mid-degree. Um, so by that, I mean that they're in their second or third year of study out of sometimes four-year degrees, some are in two-year degrees. Um, it's quite an immersive activity in which students role play the health professions that they'll be moving into once they, once they graduate or some play the patient or carer. And it's done by, via a video recording. And it's really been designed to provide health professional students with the opportunity to work in interprofessional teams. And with that, we want them to learn how to work as effective team members, um, as well as really advocating for their patient. So students work in teams of five to six to devise a patient management plan for a complex patient case. Um, some of the cases involved uh, could be a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, could be COVID-19, um, a stroke patient. We've got a whole range. There's a database of about 20 that we use and we select 10 each year and each group is allocated one case. Um, the groups are predetermined by us and we ensure that there's an interprofessional mix of at least four students in each team, uh, sorry, four disciplines in each team. Um, and it's really designed to be interactive and ensure active engagement of all students. So we have a peer review activity that's completed at the end of their assessment. And that's where we can see which students did contribute and which ones were almost freeloading. Um, those ones that don't contribute enough are invited to do the HCC again. So I thought I'd start rather than explaining the HCC in detail by giving you a 2018 student example. Um, this is a video submission, so it goes for five minutes long, but I might cut it short depending on how we're going for time. These students had the patient, um, Brent Davies, who is quite unfortunate. So I'll start that for you, and then we might um, finish a little bit early rather than watching the whole thing. I'm your doctor. What I'm looking to do for you is to manage your infections, let's review your antibiotics, and let's help to minimize the impact of those seizures. 
Um, I know you're having some troubles with your medication, so I'm hoping to reduce the amount you can take, but we still want to make sure that you're getting the same benefits from them. I know you're also having a bit of trouble with depression, so I'll hopefully refer you to a psychiatrist so you can talk to someone about it. Hi Brett, my name's Laura, I'm your radar keeper, so I'll be working closely with your doctor to ensure you get the right imaging. Also try to keep your radiation dose to a minimum because you will require multiple imaging examinations. For example, you may require to take a cone beam CT, it's just a picture of your teeth to show to look at your bone and your soft tissue. Also to manage your spinal pain, we may need to do an epidural back injection and this will lessen your pain and motivate you to be more active. Hi Brent, I'm Jenny the physiotherapist and what I would like to work with you are to find ways to involve your family and interests so you continue to increase your function and physical activity to help you with your everyday life. We will increase the strength and function of your right upper limb so you're able to do activities. We will also improve the way you walk with gait training, balance and coordination in your lower body to help you move in and out of your home. Hi Brent, my name is Kitty and I'm your exercise physiologist. I would like to work together with you to design an exercise program that aims to help for weight loss and to reduce sedentary time. I would also like to identify any barriers that you might have that is contributing to your lack of motivation. Hi Brent, my name's Catherine, I'm your speech pathologist. I'll be working with you to help with your talking and getting your message across as I know that's been really frustrating for you. I know your family are really keen to support you too and I'll give them some strategies to help in your conversations. And I'll also work really closely with all the team members so they're familiar with the best ways to help support your communication. Hi there Brent, I'm your nurse for today and I do understand your concerns about being in the hospital and I just wanted to let you know about some services. I'll just pause it there. Um, I think you get the idea of the video. So if I skip ahead, you can see them all having more team meetings um, and you see the patient leaving the, the hospital as well. Services out in the... Okay, so some of the learning outcomes that I think that these this team did really well at demonstrating um, was to understand the contributions of a range of health professions in meeting patients' needs. They integrated and prioritised the contributions from each health profession into the management plan. And they really applied a collaborative approach to problem solving in the form of the video. So the whole purpose of the HCC is to prepare students for interprofessional practice. And we really want them to learn how to work as an effective health care team member. Um, and you only get this through practice. Um, and the simulation activity, uh, because it is such a low fidelity activity, we are able to reach larger numbers of students and include um, so many disciplines. And it enables us to meet accreditation requirements as well. So the whole HCC is managed online. Um, this is a screenshot of our Canvas site, which is our learning management system. And you can see a series of steps for students um, to take part in. So they're given the HCC guide, which is the assessment requirements up the top there in orange. And then they move down through the steps. So preparation is the pre-module that they do. And that forms, um, it's broken down into two parts. The first one lists the health professions that they'll be working with and um, describes their roles and responsibilities. And the second component teaches them how to peer review other videos. So they know exactly what they need to include in their own video and also um, how to provide information and grade the other students' submissions as well. And it's a really good reflective task for them to do. Um, the second step, is their team information. So we obviously need to group these close to 700 students into good interprofessional mixes. Um, this is communicated through a portal using SRES. Um, and this gives them their team information. When it was face-to-face, -face, it included room information as well as their case. Uh, they then attend the HCC and on that day, they complete the video activity and the abstract and they give them three days to submit this. Following on from that, they complete the team peer review activity. Um, which there's two um, peer reviews. So one is the video. So they mark two other video submissions of the same patient case. And they also peer review their own team members and reflect on their own um, contribution to that team effort. They then have an optional evaluation survey at the end. And then they um, are provided their results, their end grades at the end via that SRES portal again. Um, and I should mention that the abstract or the written patient management plan is one page long and that's worth 40% and the video is worth 60%.
So student numbers have increased. They started at 16 in 2012, and you can see slow, not slow, it's pretty rapid growth um, over the years. So it started as a voluntary activity. Students didn't create a video, it was an oral presentation. You can see then that it moved to a video submission in 2014 with 77 students from across eight disciplines. This was the year that the organising team submitted for an educational innovation grant, which they received in 2015, and that enabled them to enlarge the um, simulation activity to reach 1,200 students. They introduced the peer video assessment and made it mandatory, so they embedded this assessment within units of study. Um, in 2016, that's a photo from 2016 up in the top left, um, they took a more flipped learning approach and also included the intra-team peer review so that we could see who was um, contributing to the team effort and students became accountable for their contributions as well. Numbers grew to 1,624 with 11 disciplines and in 2018 and 2019 we knew that that 2016 model was working so we made very little changes and just continued on with the same approach. Um, the bottom right picture is of the registration um, area in 2018 and you can see it was quite busy but then with um, COVID in 2020 we obviously needed to rethink how we would deliver this large simulation activity. So we had five months warning because this activity runs in August so we decided we would deliver it um, through self-organized Zoom rooms. We had a slight drop in student numbers because pharmacy couldn't be involved due to semester timetable um, changes um, and in 2021, we actually had a growth in student numbers again, and we introduced medical sciences for the first time. We also introduced a drop-in consultation session. Um, this was run at the start of the HCC day, which is um, one full day that all of the students have a dedicated day free in their timetable. And this is where students could come along and meet with a, an academic in a breakout room and ask any questions that they had but the questions weren't allowed to be clinical. Um, here's a snapshot of the assessment components that are um, shown to students in the form of a rubric. So you can see the criteria um, for the video is um, making sure you have a carer's perspective. And I think that last video really showed um, the patient's point of view from the angle that they shot that video in. Um, then they need to demonstrate interprofessional negotiation, action in care, um, produce distinctive outcomes, as well as think about the way they presented their care plan in the form of that video. And the abstract, they needed to identify the key problems or prioritise the issues, um, provide specific examples of how they would address those issues. And it could be a simple thing as what tool they would use, um, as well as identify and respond to patient safety issues. Sometimes these things we noticed were missed. So it was really important. And this was highlighted a few times in, in the instruction guide. Um, and that's also something that students really learnt about. Um, we often, when we look at the evaluation data, we can see students didn't know what a Webster pack was, or they didn't know, didn't think about hand support rails in a shower. So you can see that they're really learning about each other's professions. Uh, communication needed to be clear. And we also wanted quality of evidence provided. So we wanted to see national guidelines used as well as peer reviewed journals. Okay, so we're going to use the chat function here to spot the difference. Um, there's not 10 differences and it doesn't involve the Mr. Men characters, but we're going to look at a 2020 submission, which is an online video submission. And while you're watching the clip, I'd like you to consider the assessment components um, that we discussed and whether you think these could be achieved um, in the same way when you consider online versus face-to-face -face learning. And also maybe think about what we needed to consider logistically with organising such an event. I'm Jacinta, the respiratory consultant looking after John Rothman, a 67-year-old male who initially presented with severe worsening cough, fevers, shortness of breath with... Sorry, I'm just going to make sure that volume is loud. ...wheeze. His current diagnosis is COVID-19. He was recently transferred to the COVID ward two days ago, following a 14-day stay in ICU. My major concerns are John's cardiac and respiratory function, his current immobility, nutritional status, and eventual discharge plan. I've got all this phlegm in my throat. Someone taught me the whole breathing and coughing thing, but I don't think it works, so I haven't been doing it. Ah, I see. I'm going to have a chat with my physio. We really need to clear out those secretions. 
strong are the only percussions work? Yes, definitely agree that we need to help John clear his secretions. Percussion takes up a lot of busier resources though. What I propose instead is that we teach him the correct ACBT technique. How does that sound? Will that clear his secretions? We won't know until we try, but evidence shows that ACBT is as effective as percussion. Okay, that sounds good. Great. We will also explain to him the importance of doing ACBT regularly and keeping active. Can your team reinforce that message? We sure can. We'll include this on the discharge summary that we sent to his GP. There are so many medications to take. I don't know what they're all for. Do I have to keep taking all of these when I leave? Thanks for letting me know, John. Let me speak to the team. Hi, team. I'm concerned about John's polypharmacy. He's on quetiapine and amiodarone. Do we need to continue these? Once John stabilizes, we do want to reduce and discontinue some of these. We place him on quetiapine after he had some delirium in the ICU. But we could review that now and cease it. Since his atrial fibrillation has stopped, we could cease his amiodarone too. Great, I'll sort out a Webster pack for John to make, taking his medications easier, and check that he knows how to use an inhaler and spacer for his salbutamol and ipratropium. Agreed. I think you should continue with those two inhalers. I think we definitely need to manage his hypertension and dyslipidemia pharmacologically, so I would like to keep him on resuvastatin and get him back on his herbosatin and hydrochlorothiazide, which he's pretty used to. I'd also like to see John regularly and keep monitoring how he's managing and look out for any late complications of his COVID infection with some regular lung, liver and kidney function tests. I've had this tube in my mouth that's been giving me food while I've been in hospital. How will this work when I go home? Do I have to keep being fed like this? I'm going to stop it there because it is a, a five minute video. Um, I'm not sure if we can use a Zoom chat feature, maybe someone can confirm that, but I thought we could list some of the differences that you noticed between the face-to-face -face and the online um, simulation activity um, just by typing a few things into the chat. And you might like to also consider the, like the learning aspects as well as the logistical or planning aspects that we would have had to consider. I can see Jen, um, Jenny has already popped something in the chat, thank you. So if the videos are representative, perhaps the limits of distance and connection only through technology had the students focus more on content and learning outcomes than um, production characteristics. And I completely agree with that. We did notice that. Um, I think that the recording didn't seem as daunting for students because they knew they could just hit record on Zoom and then post that as their final video. Maybe people could think about whether it was easier to run the HCC online or face-to-face. -face. And Belinda wrote the first video um, did seem more authentic though. Um, and I would agree. Um, you could see in the second video, people had to hold up the signs of I'm at the patient bedside um, and change characters as well, which you couldn't easily achieve in the online um, version. Might move on to the next slide. So with the face-to-face -face and online, the activity was essentially the same for students. So we had the same timeline, the same activity overall, same rubrics. Um, the same peer review activities and the same Canvas site. We just had to do slight modifications to the task. So we ensured that we um, described the task or the video recording as a case conference so that students didn't feel they had to have amazing animation skills and video editing skills to do it from different houses. Um, and we also asked them to self-organize their Zoom rooms because of the logistics involved in us organizing them would be too complicated. Um, there were close to 300 student teams. They also requested more academic involvement in 2020. So we made the effort of having that drop-in session at the start um, of 2021, so that students felt that connection with staff and that they weren't left on their own. They could ask those questions that they would have had. Um, and I can see a few more things just popping into the chat. Um, so logistics are different rather than easier or harder. 
Um, I agree, but I do actually find online a bit easier to organise, but maybe that's to do with room bookings. Um, yeah, time zones. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think everyone can probably open up the chat and see what's going on there. Um, and Kelly wrote, language is so important um, and be explicit in instructions, especially with so many teams. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and scripted, read sorry, read responses don't allow a student to see the impact of how phrasing lands with a patient. Yeah, I didn't, that's something I actually didn't really consider. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, and then, so they wanted more academic involvement. So we, we gave them that and feedback was really positive in relation to that drop-in session. We had around 20% of the teams drop in. Um, so I'll share with you some evaluation data. Uh, we had about a 33% response rate. So we asked the question in 2020 and 2021 of, or oh, it's not a question, the statement, in the future, I would prefer that our interprofessional team meeting were face-to-face. -face. And you can see that less students were wanting face-to-face -face, um, in 2021. And we're not sure if, sure if it was growing familiarity with online learning, um, whether it was the convenience, we don't know the, quite the reasoning behind it, but students were um, rating that more positively. Uh, and then if we look at the overall evaluation data, so this is done on a scale of um, one to five, we'd strongly agree, um, through to the rate of strongly disagree. And you can see overall it rates quite positively. Um, and the ones that we need to work on is the um, working on the production of a video developed my collaborative teamwork skills. We find that some disciplines or some students just don't like the video format. They think that a written patient management plan would, would suffice. Um, and generally we find that that's the medical and dentistry students and we don't know if it's the types of other assessments that they complete or whether they're time poor. Um, the HCC sharpen my patient management skills is also another area that we need to look at as well as the clinical problem solving skills. But overall you can see it's quite positively rated. Uh, we really take quite a bit of time in the patient case development and it's circulated to all of the disciplinary experts prior to a case being released to students. And we generally add one, one or two patient cases e each year um, and they're modified based on student feedback. And this one highlighted in yellow is one that I found quite interesting. So when we look at 2019 to, that's our last face-to-face -face session compared to 2021, which was our online or second online year, in response to the um, statement, overall the HCC was worthwhile in developing my readiness for collaborative healthcare, you can see that um, there's an improvement there with 68.2% strongly agreeing or agreeing with that statement compared to 53.7. Um, and overall, it seems quite similar in responses with the other questions. And because of the success of the HCC, um, we started running other activities online as well using Zoom. And we found that uh, there were lots of benefits associated with, with this. So we had no room bookings and we know how tricky timetabling and room bookings can be, especially for interprofessional activities. It also com um, combats changing restrictions. So we had different room limits with numbers or capacity issues. So being online eliminated that, that concern. Uh, we have wider reach, so we're able to reach 2,550 students in one of our activities that, is, that runs at the start of each year. And it seems more convenient for students. In 2018, we had approximately 100 students not show up on HCC day. And then in 2020, there were around 20 that weren't able to attend due to illness or other, other reasons. Um, so it does seem more convenient for students. And it's also more engaging for staff. We find we have more um, facilitator volunteers um, since, since these activities have been running online. So this is the um, breakout room activity that Belinda was mentioning earlier. So we'd like you to consider a simulation program that you're already involved in. Uh, we're going to have two breakout groups. So group one will look at how may you consider upscaling the program. So um, think about resourcing, maybe it could be student led, what you can do to modify the activity to have more reach. And then group two will look at how may you consider making the program more interprofessional. Um, and we have the suggestion of using a SWOT analysis of looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats with adding another health profession to your activity. Um, 
I might stop slide sharing so we're able to move into breakout rooms. I'm wondering, Christy, if we had a minute, did you want to see if there's anyone from uh, any of the rooms who may just want to give like a really quick couple of points of what they discussed or any kind of feedback from that exercise? I think that sounds good. We actually had, we were a bit unfortunate, we had mic issues in our group. So it ended up being um, Jenny and I having a conversation about okay. um, running the HCC. So I'm not sure if, if the group you're in would like to go first, if there's any willing speakers. Yeah, we had some really great chat and um, we really tried to help brainstorm mostly with Jess um, about some of overcoming some of the barriers to having uh, more IPL sim uh, at her uh, institution. So maybe Jess, did you have any kind of takeaways that you can now mill over? Um, yeah, I think for me, it's just coming back to that uh, value add and, and what is the value that the activity provides and how do we package that so that it does sell the value in itself? Yeah, and so we talked about finding those IPL champions, um, making it not like a an added extra that wasn't really necessary, but really integrated as part of the curriculum, part of a unit of study with associated assessment and, you know, give it that real legitimacy that's been supported by a group of champions. Uh, even pilot it first and present what those achievements and evaluations and findings show in order to then build the momentum for a larger scale. Uh, yeah, we had some really great conversation uh, in our room, but um, uh, I'll let you keep going. Thanks. It's fantastic. I to no, share that. They're um, all points that I have in my upcoming slides as well, so it's good that you considered those yourselves. Um, so I'll go on to, these are kind of, I guess, my take-home messages, especially if you're thinking about going large scale with any activities. Um, and the first is try and make it student-led where possible. So use a flipped classroom approach and have lots of prior planning. So for this HCC, we often get dates in calendars three years in advance just to make sure that particular units are available to take part in that activity. And that sounds almost ridiculous, but that's what's needed. Um, and this is just a nice quote that a student said um, to show that the Kind of students taking on that assessment part isn't a terrible thing that they actually learn a lot from it so um, one of the most valuable learning experiences for this medical student was to not only not only working with my team but watching the videos and seeing how other teams handled the same case so it's a reflective exercise for them make it count so try and embed these activities within units of study if you can and make it an assessment task where it's needed if it is an assessment task make the waiting um, the same for every unit of study, if possible. So we've had issues in the past where there was a 20% waiting on the assessment task for some, and then it was pass-fail for others. So we found the common ground being pass-fail because that's all that some units would allow. Um, so try and have that equality between units. Uh, and this student said, it was great to be able to practice this as a student as I haven't participated in a multidisciplinary team meeting on placement yet. It was great to learn about other professionals and how they contribute to the patient's care. It was a valuable experience. So this speech pathology student was unlucky and I'm sure you'll find lots of um, our cohorts haven't had that placement experience because of COVID um, with our senior students taking priority. So these simulated activities fill that gap. Modify and improve. So we continuously evaluate the HCC at the end of each year. Um, and that way we can make small improvements or adjustments each year that are manageable and also move with the time. So we try to refine our cases um, with relevant topics like COVID-19 patients, as well as the platform. You need to consider technology and how this can change and how you need to quickly move from one platform to another if needed. And my final one is to find your champion. So as Belinda mentioned from her group, um, and I think Jessica might've said it as well, Find people that are engaged and enthusiastic and people that are not just thinkers but the doers you need them to go out there um, and to possibly recruit people if it's into professional activities and to um, gain enthusiasm and excitement with these activities as well um, so thank you for your time
I am available via email or Twitter if you would like to know more about the HCC or have any other questions. Um, and I think we're going to have a bit of a question session if we, I think we've only got about seven minutes. We can see how we go. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that presentation and, and I think can acknowledge the wonderful work to help put together something of such quality and so carefully considered and being able to roll that out to such a large number of students. There are, um, there was uh, great stuff moving through the chat. There's also some more formal questions on the WOVA. Um, one thing that uh, attendees would like to know more about, you said that students um, attended like a drop-in session, but it, it wasn't to give kind of clinical sort of cheap notes or whatever. What, what were the, per like, what did they attend to do at those drop-in sessions? Uh, so it was more about the task itself. So how could they integrate more negotiation into their video? Um, perhaps it could be um, they weren't sure what their patient management plan should look like, whether it should be in the point of um, dot points or whether it should be paragraphs. How do you make that look integrated? We did have some students in previous years saying, I'm a pharmacist, I do this. I'm a speech pathologist, I would do this. So it was um, giving them... Um, information related to that and although it was in the canvas site because there is so much information there they just wanted that guidance or in a verbal format so that it, um, they felt that they had that support there and that they were on the right track. Awesome thank you. Another question was and it's one of those tricky words to kind of use appropriately and, and lots of people have different um, ideas about what it might mean. But I guess when you introduced it, you talked about it being more of a low fidelity activity. And, you know, did you use that term because it, there isn't the um, use of uh, mannequins or adopting simulated patients? Was that kind of your reasoning around defining it as a low fidelity type activity, even yeah. though it's sort of active and immersive at the same time? Yeah, I guess because, yeah, we don't have simulated patients or mannequins. It's more case-based and students can take that um, the direction they like. So sometimes we get animated submissions. It's not um, student role-playing. Um, it's kind of open to them as how they'd like to present that information back. Awesome. And I think we have talked about this a little bit already, but there was uh, some thoughts if there other particular strategies that you could identify that might help get all the disciplines to find agreements on dates and things like that. So do you have any more things to share about how to make that happen? Yeah, um, I think a top-down approach helps with that. So if you are informed from the associate dean that you are to clear this day out in your calendar, then you're going to do it. So I think having support from the um, executive team is really important, as well as your champions in each school saying that's worthwhile. Um, and then having the, that evaluation data to prove that it is a valuable learning experience um, is more encouraging for people to get on board. Thank you. So I think we might think about wrapping up, Christy. Um, we want to say a huge thank you for spending your afternoon with us and sharing the achievements of a really fantastic program um, that were kind of in awe of how you do it. Uh, it's been really, really enjoyable and I, and I hope that our participants also enjoyed it. So thank you again. Uh, please remember to reach out uh, to Christy if you'd like some more ideas or you want to do some brainstorming with her or share your, I'm sure she will be um, very happy to do that. Um, some more chat notes coming in about you know, how terrific it was and well done and thanks for sharing about the HCC um, and I echo those thoughts. So happy to wrap up now. Uh, guys, go have uh, a bit of a break. You might want to pop into um, some virtual exhibition type stuff coming up and, and have a breather and a coffee. Um, thank you again for joining me and enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you, Christy. Thanks so much, Belinda. Thanks, everyone.